we started asking what is the church a while back and one of the things that comes up is this question of whether or not the church is Jewish and it's a little harder to answer that question than uh, it first seems so that's why we're letting the scriptures talk about this matter but the church is um, is governed by God and his word and yet we understand that you know the way people talk today we got to understand that the word church is always referring to Christians and the word Jewish is always referring to non-Christians the way that people speak today um, we mean you know we don't mean to make any confusion there or to make any you know whatever accusations or value judgments whatever you want to think about what we're trying to do is get back to what is written in the scriptures and let the thinking be guided by the ancient texts rather than confused by the modern dilemmas. Um, the first thing when we asked, is the church Jewish, was to show that the law pointed to this Jesus that he came through Israel, that he's descended from Israel, that his apostles are Israelites. All of them are. That all of Scripture came from Israel, Romans 3, that we owe everything we know about God to ancient Israel. And uh, he became that lawgiver over his kingdom, Jesus did, in Acts 2 and verse 36, is very plainly stated that God made him Lord in Christ, the Jesus who was crucified. So now when we ask, is it Jewish is the church Jewish. We are talking about the response to this. And I, well, this is where some of the modern confusion comes from, I think. It's good to have an explanation. So the first thing we should say is that on Jesus, the establishment of Jesus' kingdom, as was stated succinctly in Acts 2.36, there were some in ancient Israel at the time who accepted Jesus as the king. And so I want to look at that first. Some of them accepted this reign of Jesus as the Christ, the anointed, the king of God's choice. And they saw the implementation of his law, his authority, as the perfect fulfillment of Moses' law. Now, the, these Jews who accepted the reign of Jesus saw obedience to the gospel of Christ, obedience to the law of Christ is just the natural outgrowth of everything they had learned in the law of Moses. This is the first thing that we should say is there were some who accepted Jesus as the Christ. They became Christians, if you will, and they saw this as perfectly acceptable, perfectly congruent, a natural outgrowth of what they had learned. And so I wanted to take a couple of examples. We have Matthew chapter 13. Just verses 51 and 52 illustrate a thought on this point, which is Jesus taught all of the people at some point in time in his teaching on earth, he taught everybody by means of parables. Rather than direct statement, he would give these parables that they had to interpret and understand. And uh, he asked his disciples in Matthew 13, 51, 51, have you understood all these things? Which, you know, they said they did. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. What we're saying here is that these Israelites who are his apostles are intended to understand the teaching. And he's calling them a scribe, if you will. They're knowledgeable about the law of Moses. They've been trained for the kingdom, that is the kingdom of Christ. And these are able to bring out of the treasure that's inside them what is new and what is old. As in, they can understand the things that Moses wrote, and they can understand the, Je the things that Jesus said, and they can put these things together. These ancient Israelites saw it that way. That's why they obeyed Jesus. And over in Romans chapter 11, the ancient Israelite Paul wrote about the relationship between ancient Israel and all the other nations. 
with regard to obedience to the gospel, that many nations were obeying the gospel at a time when the nation of Israel was really distancing themselves from this Jesus and trying to make that differentiation that they're not going to do it. But they are described as the root, Israel is. And if the root is holy, so are the branches, the 16th verse of Romans 11 says. And he gives an illustration of how the nations who obey the gospel are, are coming to God the way that you would graft um, a branch into an existing plant. That the, the nations who obey God, the gospel of God are, are being grafted into the existing Israelite nation, if you will. That's the illustration that he's using. But even then, in the 24th verse, he said, uh, if you... Romans were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into the cultivated one. Well, how much more will these Israelites, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? It's just natural, is the way that Paul is saying this. We don't want to get lost in everything that he's saying there, but just to say this for them, for their way of thinking, is this is the natural outgrowth of it, the maturity of it. It's easy. Even if they fall away, it's easy for them to be grafted back in. And Paul further said in the second letter to Timothy, in the third chapter, to the young man, Timothy, who was raised by a Jewish grandmother, a Jewish mother. He said to him there in the 14th verse of 2 Timothy 3, As for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In, in, Israel, in uh, Paul's way of looking at this, and Timothy as well, clearly, Israel matures by means of the word of God. He was raised on the scriptures. He's known them from childhood, and he can rely on those things in order to become wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Again, becoming a Christian for these Jews is just a natural outgrowth of keeping the law of Moses. It just follows. It just makes sense. And in Galatians 3, At verse 24, beginning down through 29, is this illustration from Paul again. The law was our guardian, the law of Moses, that is, was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by the faith that is in Christ. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you're all sons of God through faith. All of you who are sons, uh, or all of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring too, and heirs according to the promise that was made to him. But Moses' law is a guide to bring us to Christ. We're no longer under that guardian that Moses' law was. There is no longer a distinction being drawn between the Jewish and the other nations. The Jews who accepted Jesus Christ in that time in the first century, Paul is an example, Timothy, others, saw the law of Moses as an instructor that would bring both the nation of Israel and the rest of the nations in this world together in Christ Jesus by faith. So we want to establish that first, that there were those who saw it as a natural outgrowth, and that is where your New Testament is coming from. However, in Acts chapter 13, there is a, a detailed example of some who rejected it, and I do want to look at this one for a little bit because I think that it captures all of the themes that need to be brought out on this. But it's still not the main point of our discussion today. So I don't want to stay 
Uh, I don't want to take a lot of time on it, but I want to explain it sufficiently. Fact is that some of them, as we read, accepted Jesus and his reign as the new king under the new Israel, and they saw it as a natural outgrowth of the law of Moses. But there were some who did not, and they chose to remain under the rules and regulations of the law of Moses, refusing to accept any claim that Jesus was the king, that he was the Messiah, that he was the heir of the things the law of Moses spoke about. They wouldn't grant any validity to that claim at all. And it is those Jews who did not see obedience to the gospel as a natural outgrowth, but rather said, we're not going to have anything to do with this. They are the ones who made a distinction between themselves and the Jews who accepted Jesus. And this is really where you come up with the modern distinction between Jew Jewish and Christian. Um, Acts 13 is the place Paul is traveling and preaching the gospel. He arrives in Antioch, preaching as he has been doing. And uh, again, I'm providing the verses for you. You can read into this in more detail on your own time if you'd like to get a better understanding of these things, but I think we'll get this. Acts 13, uh, verses 14 to 16 is the first place. When Paul, traveling, arrived at this place in Antioch, he went on the Sabbath day to the synagogue. And he was called upon by the leaders of the synagogue to speak. And so he did. And when he addressed them, he said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, that is, those who are present, who maybe were not Israelites, you listen. So the first thing he's doing is to walk into a synagogue where they still accept him as one of them. And when he addresses them, he does so with all respect and decorum. And if you skip a little bit to the 26th, he said, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, 26 and 27, the second point here. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. To those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they didn't recognize him or understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. So he said, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, he addresses them as his brothers, because they are. But he admits that the people of Jerusalem and the rulers in Jerusalem did not recognize Jesus. They did not recognize the king. They did not understand the prophets. And unfortunately, in this, set, uh, in this they fulfilled the prophecy that he would suffer when they condemned him to death at the hands of Rome. However, in the 30th verse, God raised Jesus from the dead, 30 to 33, and for many days, Jesus appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now as witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God has promised to the fathers, he has fulfilled to their children, that's us, by raising Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I've begotten you. So what God promised to the fathers He's fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. The way Paul sees this is we are fulfilling exactly what was promised to us. And the resurrection of Jesus is exactly what God was talking about when he spoke these promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. In the 38th verse, he finishes out saying, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man... Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. It's 38 to 42. By him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you couldn't be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. I'm doing a work in your days, a work you'll not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged these things might be told them the next Sabbath day. 
So he said very plainly, we are freed from everything that the law of Moses couldn't free us from. And they begged this to, ha to be spoken again the next week, the next Saturday. And so on the next Saturday, 44 to 47 captures, almost the whole city gathered together to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds that were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary the word of God be spoken first to you, but since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the nations. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I've made you a light for the nations, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Yes, there were those who rejected this message. You see that Paul's speaking after being invited, after sitting down in a synagogue, and addresses them as his brothers, and uses the law, the Psalms, the prophets, to show how we are fulfilling these things in Christ Jesus. But these rejected that and began to contradict and to revile This is the limited sense in which, you know, Jews do not accept Jesus and Christians do. Okay. The fact is, this is this here in Acts 13 is kind of the first time that people were drawing a distinction between a Jew and a Christian. It's kind of this, the first time in history when there is this serious fundamental rift among the physical descendants of ancient Israel. Where some are saying, well, no, I'm the Jew, you're not a Jew. And, and the others were saying, well, no, that, you know, we're, we're all sons of God through faith. Now, this is the first time there's this major rift, okay? But I want us to understand this because and it's the reason why we ask, well, you know, it's a valid question, was the church, is the church Jewish? Because all of the first Christians were Jewish. That is a fact. All the first Christians were Israelites. That's where this thing came from. Rome made no distinction. They were Jews. All of them were Jews. This distinction came later, as we noted. So I want us to get that in mind too, that you know, from the beginning, when you have people obeying the gospel of Christ, accepting that Jesus is the king in Acts chapter 2, that you know, those 3,000 who obeyed the gospel, 3,000 husbands obeyed the gospel, there's, you know, however many people that probably is, what, 6,000, 10,000, don't know. From that time in Acts chapter 2 until at least Acts chapter 8, where uh, an official of Ethiopia is on his way home from worshiping in Jerusalem at the holidays. All of these people who are being baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins are Israelites, every one of them. These are Israelites. And it was that way, at least through Acts 8. In Acts chapter 8, we read in the first verse, that a persecution arose against the church at that time. And when that happened, they were scattered from the city of Jerusalem into all the regions all about. That's the first time you have this teaching about the kingdom leave the city of Jerusalem. They stayed there for a time, but now they're scattered. And later in the Acts, in chapter 11, and verse 19, before everybody catches on to what they're supposed to be doing, it said that those who had been scattered went about speaking the word to no one except Jews. It was their understanding, too, at the time that they were just Jews. They were just continuing in the traditions of their fathers, in the teachings of of the law, that they were completely fulfilling what the law said. All Israelites at the church of Jerusalem, scattered from Jerusalem, continued to think of themselves as Israelites. That's the way that was. 
And even the first letters, you know, first letter from Peter is clearly one of the earliest, if not the earliest, and the letter from James clearly one of the earliest, if not the earliest. Because 1 Peter 1 and verse 1 is from the apostle Peter, but it's uh, addressed to the elect exiles of the dispersion. And that dispersion refers back to Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. It's the word for the scattering. They were dispersed from Jerusalem, Acts 8, 1, but scattered is the word. It's kind of fun, actually. The, the Greek word is skedanomi, which we always love because it sounds like skedaddle, you know. <laughs> I like that. That one's easy to remember. Skedaddle, you know, get scattered out of here. That's what they did. They skedaddled out of there into all the various regions. Well, this is the, the elect exiles of the dispersion says Peter, and James, for his part, addresses his letter to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Again, it, it jives with what we read in Acts 11, that those who were scattered from there saw themselves as Israelites and spoke the word only among Israelites. And it was perfectly normal what we saw in Acts 13, where Paul shows up and worships God acceptably, according to the law of Moses, and they ask him to speak, and he addresses them as brothers. That thing in and of itself is clean. They see it this way. It's coming, especially through Peter, as we're about to see in Acts chapter 10. It's going to be made clear to them what they have missed, what they have overlooked, and really everybody did. I don't see this to blame them. But it's going to be made clear to them here at the right time that actually God is going to welcome into his assembly the worshipers from every nation. So here in Acts 10, in every nation, Peter realizes God shows no partiality, but anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Peter was shown a vision to make clear that God has cleansed them. He's gone into the household of a Roman family, not Israelites, and he is speaking the gospel to them. They invited him to speak because God told them to invite him, because God does hear the prayers of people who are not Israelites, and people who are not Christians. In every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him is the first thing out of Peter's mouth when he shows up at this Roman household. And then... The Spirit of God falls on them. And the 44th verse of Acts 10 and 45 record, while Peter was still saying this, the Spirit fell on them who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, that is, the Jewish believers, the Israelites who'd come with Peter, were amazed because the Holy Spirit's gift was poured out even on these nations. They were surprised. They didn't understand that. Peter had just understood it. And now this symbol makes clear to them. Well, when Peter leaves there and he goes back in Acts 11, verses 1 through 3, the record shows that, well, the word got back to Judea. And when Peter arrives in Jerusalem, he faces criticism from his fellow Israelites who are Christians. They didn't understand, in other words, yet. The vision Peter had been shown, that all the nations are acceptable so he relates to them what God had done. He relates to them how the Spirit fell on these Romans in the 11th chapter, verses 15 down through 18. He said, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as he had on us at the beginning. That is to say, just like it happened in Acts chapter 2. And yes, that is also to say it hasn't happened since that point in time. For people who think it did, there's nothing scriptural about that. But he said, I remembered the word of the Lord who said, John baptized with water, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, well, who was I that I could stand in God's way? They heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God by saying, then to the nations too, God has granted repentance that leads to life. They understood Soon enough, that God welcomes everybody. And this is the meaning of Galatians 
chapter 6, where we invite everybody to obey the gospel still. When Paul writes to the church there, boy, they've got some problems for various and sundry reasons, but among these problems is this idea that, oh, we've got to keep these tenets of the law of Moses, even though these things actually have their fulfillment in a spiritual way in Christ Jesus. Some were saying, oh, you've got to be circumcised in the flesh, when in fact circumcision is the sign of repentance. A repentance of heart is the real circumcision, and it's better and more important and completely fulfills the circumcision of the flesh. What you need is repentance. And that's why he says in Galatians 6, verse 15, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Are you a new person in Christ Jesus? Are you repentant? That's what matters. As for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. This is who we are. That's what the church is. Is it Jewish? You make of that what you will. What it certainly is, is the religion of Abraham. To believe in God by faith, to believe in God, to trust him, to obey him, to fulfill all that was written about him in in one descendant to whom God promised to give everything, and that's Christ Jesus. We believe that we are the recipients of all the promises that had been made and that promise that God would bless all the nations in his one singular seed. That's in Christ Jesus. That's the Israel of God, which is different from the physical descendants of Abraham, to be fair. Although the physical descendants of Abraham includes a lot of other nations besides Israel. If you remember, he also had um, he also had um, uh, children by the normal means, a child by the normal means in Ishmael, and for that matter, in Isaac uh, they were named, but Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau, were not both chosen but only Jacob. The Israel of God is always a spiritual choice by God. God is the one who draws the distinction. This is the meaning for us. We are fulfilling everything that was written before, not undoing it, not calling it dirty or unclean. It's not that. It's just that there is a spiritual meaning for these things, and that is where God's emphasis is, and that's the thing that really matters. As Paul said, the circumcision or the uncircumcision, that's not the point. The point is the new creation. It doesn't help you to be circumcised if you're not repentant, if you're not a new creation. The circumcision means nothing. It's symbolic, symbolism over substance. But then again, the substance is the repentance, and if you are repentant and your heart is right with God, then the symbol of repentance is only symbolic and its absence is not meaningful. That's all we're saying. That's the Israel of God is the spiritual people who follow in the faith of Abraham. That's what the church is. It's what the church has always been. And yes, at first, everybody was an Israelite. There were no Christians who were not Israelites. It came from Israel. It was written down by Israel. Everything we know about God has come through the scriptures, which belong to Israel. That's true. We owe them everything, still. That that ancient nation carved the way for the rest of humanity for the rest of time, and it's a very special thing, and we owe them a debt of gratitude. It's true. And they have an advantage in every way, as Paul said. Much in every way is the advantage for the Jew. Yep, that's true. 
They had the promises, they had the covenants, they were brought up with the truth. They had a religion that was the real religion, a real, a real religion, a religion from God that was clean, that was acceptable, that Paul could still participate in helpfully and try to reach them and try to bring them up. Yes, that's an advantage, that's true. But the point of those things, of course, is the attainment of the hope of the promise made that is fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus, fulfilled in the kingship of the Lord, the forgiveness of sins through him. Don't you believe that God can save by faith? Don't you believe that God chose to pull Abraham out by faith, that he chose Isaac because he was the one that came by promise and by faith, that he chose Jacob because of the faith It's always been his choice to decide who are his children, to reckon his children by faith. Today, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he is the king whom God has anointed, that he is the fulfillment of all that was written before? Do you believe that God is right and you have been wrong? Then change your heart to serve God from now on. Turn over a new leaf, start a new life. Repent. Be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins and be freed from everything, including the things that the law of Moses couldn't free you from. Oh, the law of Moses steered you clear of a lot of things and it defined sin for you, it's true. But there were still things that it couldn't help with. Those things are fulfilled in Christ. Become a Christian, a child of God. We have water prepared. Are you a Christian already but haven't lived right? Let us help you with our prayers that you might be restored to him. Let your need be known in the Holy Spirit, in, in the Spirit, the needs that you have in the Spirit. Let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and while we sing.